Ta-da! This sweatshirt I got from Sista Sci-Fi, which is an online black queer woman-owned store that sells black science fiction and fantasy, as well as merch like this sweatshirt. So yes, welcome back to the big, amazing review of the slowly descending pile of books. Right now, I'm going to be talking about Maya and the Rising Dark by Rena Barron. So, I loved this book. I loved it. It is middle grade fantasy. It brings in the Orisha. It is this precocious, gifted child. Um, I think her dad's an engineer. I think her mom's a scientist. I, I don't remember her, her mom's profession, but really is a story about Maya and her, her dad and the magical world that surrounds them. Um, her dad has these like magical powers-ish and she is brought into this world and she realizes that she has like a destiny and powers too and she also has to contend with something really strange that's happening. We open the book with Maya at school and one day she like notices that all the color is drained from her surroundings. It's like she's sitting there and like somebody just washes the world around her into black, white, and gray. And she starts seeing this like strange character, this strange shadow um, around her and she's she's kind of freaking out about it and little by little she starts to realize more about the world that she lives in and she ends up being a part of like this like epic battle right so let me tell you a little bit more about the book I was attracted to this because I heard about this release this year um, I knew that there were references to the Orisha and I love any book that has a reference to the Orisha. This is a 2020 release. The publisher is HMA. Is that Houghton Mifflin? Yeah. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Okay, so let me tell you about Maya and the Rising Dark. 12-year-old Maya is daydreaming about summer break in her south side Chicago neighborhood when she witnesses the color bleed from the world. She's the only one who sees it and the other weird occurrences like the were hyenas stalking the streets at night. Not to mention there's a scary man made of showers plaguing her dreams. Her best friends try to find a reasonable explanation, perhaps a ghost uprising or a lunchroom pudding experiment gone awry. But to Maya, it sounds like something out of one of Papa's fantastical stories of her favorite Oya comics. When Papa goes missing, Maya is suddenly thrust into a world both strange and familiar as she uncovers the truth. Her father is the guardian of the veil between our world and the dark, where an army led by the Lord of Shadows, the man from Maya's nightmares, awaits. Maya herself is a godling, half Orisha and half human, and her neighborhood is a safe haven. But now that the veil is failing, the Lord of Shadows is determined to destroy the human world. Maya will have to unlock her hidden powers, save her father, and bring order to the world before darkness consumes it. She just hopes she can do it in time to attend the Comic-Con, to attend Comic-Con before the summer's over. This is a, a very charming story. Um, so I hybrid read this, and when I talk about the reading experience, I will show you my annotations because friends, these annotations are the wildest, most colorful, most bedazzled annotations I have done all year. Yes, the most. This was, an ex my bedazzling of this book is a work of art, if I do say so myself. All right, so let's get to the seven calorie shell review and I will tell you how much I loved the story. Um, so what have, I, what have I written? So. In terms of relevance to black queer lives, I don't remember, again, I don't remember if there are queer characters. I'll maybe do a little flip through and see. I don't 
there might have been but again the I feel like I don't remember <laughs> and I kind of think like if there are queer characters and I don't remember them then it wasn't really effective storytelling as far as like the queer narrative goes so I don't really remember a queer character um point of view so Maya is a young girl um, she comes from a, you know, a privileged family. Uh, she's brilliant. She is inquisitive. She's powerful. She's been trained by her dad in like various martial arts and stuff. And so I love that the story is written from the perspective of a girl because she ends up getting this really big task and has to like kind of save the world, but she's doing it as a girl. And so I think that's a very powerful point of view to be written from. Uh, I gave that half a cowrie shell because I also appreciate that um, the relative stature of her family means that, you know, she, it wasn't like she was a, a girl who was like struggling, right? And not that you need characters that struggle, but if, if the question is, you know, what would happen if this book were written from the perspective of um, the most vulnerable person, the most marginalized person? Well, mine is not that, right? So, yeah, there's definitely a hierarchy. Um, there's definitely some classism playing out that doesn't really get interrogated here from my perspective. So I got it half a, half a cowrie shell. That's that's what that's what happened. Um, a full cowrie cowrie shell for the themes because there are themes of magic, of um, accepting your power, trusting trusting your power. Um, being able to come into your power. That was a really important theme in this book. Um, and then also there's this other theme of like gentrification because there are little remarks made about Maya's neighborhood that tell us that it's going through the process of gentrification. And certainly, I mean, the idea of Maya sitting there one day and seeing the color draining from her world that is what it sometimes feels like to go through gentrification because you know you come from a community where you have like the patty shop over there and you have like the um ethiopian restaurant over there and then you have the asian food market over there and then you have like all of these different places and then all of a sudden the patty store is replaced by uh, Starbucks and the Asian food market is replaced by Walmart and then you know the West Indian beauty shop is replaced by uh, I don't know Sharper's Drug Mart or Rexall or whatever y'all have CVS right and so it is very much like the color being drained right from your community and from where you live and it becoming generic and unrecognizable and unpalatable to you because the store where you used to walk in where everybody knew your name and they were always glad you came more than a decade um now becomes a place where you're consumer racial profiled because you're a person of color and you are an other now and you know what i mean it's you're now somebody to be feared or suspected. So it's, that is, that is a subtext of, I think, what's happening here, although it's not explicitly on the page. Rant over. Um, there are some very, very powerful magical elements in this story. And the, um, I, I will say, so I hybrid read this and it was very, uh, um, it was immersive. It was immersive. So this recording had, um, I, th I don't know if it was just one narrator, but if it was one narrator, they did a great job because I felt like there were many voices. Um, but what really stood out for me in the narration was the fact that there was a lot of background, um, sound. So there is like distortion of the voices at different times. There was a lot of like, um, when the scene would change or when she went through like a portal, you would hear vroom, right? And um, so there was a lot of like um, sound mixing in the audio book, which really got me excited because I felt like I was in it. And I remember I was listening to the story 
while I was on the island filming the Written With Purpose um, intros and extras and editing my videos. And I remember a couple of situations where I had to take my bicycle and go on the ferry and then go back into downtown Toronto to run errands or whatever. And when I did that, um, I was literally riding my bicycle through Toronto Island and listening to this immersive story. And it felt like I was there, you know? Um, so it was a really interesting story. I love the friendship involved. Um, so the magical elements um, definitely stood out to me in part because of the amazing sound. Um, the world building was very good. Uh, I do need more of the world. I think it needs to be built out. There is a group that we are introduced to in the last quarter of the book and I want to learn more about this book. Now I know there's going to be a sequel to this so I'm not worried about about that. I'm looking forward to, to it. Like it was a, a very good um, beginning story in this series. So some of the random notes, just to let you know, um, this book is in the one, two, three, four, five. It is in the five cowrie shell um, area. So I did enjoy it. Some of the areas where I feel like it was lacking um, are relevance to black queer lives, although I'm not exactly sure if there were any black characters uh, who were queer or black queer themes. There might have been, but I just don't remember. Um, I'll have to just look. But so, but you know, the, the world building and the plot and the relevance and the themes were really big for me. So they, you know, this, this book really had that. Um, so it's not like it failed in terms of world building, which is one of the areas that are really important to me. But I, I really want to hear more from, from her, um, from Rita Barron, and I want to get more from this world. So um, some things that I just wrote down in my Melanin Eclectic Planner, so I'm just looking at my notes, that's what I'm looking at. Um, you know, there is a desire for her to get to know her father better. There's this whole like hidden, this magical world hidden in plain sight, which was really, really cool. Um, strong friendships, really interesting magical system. Um, and yeah, I wrote a note to talk about class. So I did that. Great fights and swordplay. And um, yeah, I just loved, I just really, really enjoyed the story. I really enjoyed the story. I want more of it. I will read the sequel. Now, Rena Barron also wrote, um, I think Rena Barron wrote an, a YA novel, and I will say that I prefer this one to the uh, YA novel that she wrote. So let me just come around and show you my amazing annotations because these are the best annotations I've done for the year. So first of all, these are my notes from my Melanin Eclectic Planner. You will see that you will see polka dots, you will see the cowries, you will see a little picture um, of what I posted on Instagram, and then the notes that I read to you today. So that is my planner. And then this is the gorgeous cover. And... If I just take you inside the book, you've got a uh, you know purple and gold situation. And when we get inside the book, let's just get. I knew very soon into this like that I wanted a dynamic pink. I started off annotating in pink, and then I was like, mm-mm. This book needs more. And so I started getting some pink and yellow, which comes across as orange, but because I needed to get like a fiery kind of energy to it because I knew it was amazing. And then this happened. <laughs> we have Be Dazzling. I used all the jewels and then these little punch um, bingo things and then I wrote and then you'll recall these curly cues from home is not a country so you you know and then the washi tape 
And this sticker is from the um, Sailor Melanin Moon um, series from Melanin Eclectic. And you can see the holographic Go Lens. You can see the holographic situation. And yes, yeah, so that is the full page. And then I just kept on going. I kept on going and going and the annotations in here, the bedazzling in here is just amazing. So you'll see I started to use purple and yellow as well and layered that on top. Every so often I would change the color scheme but always kept it within the color family. So now we've got blue and orange and turquoise here. And I just, this was definitely, this was in the summertime. I was feeling very optimistic and colorful and creative. And I thought, you know what? I want, like, I want my annotations to be like celebrations, you know? And that's what I think I was able to accomplish here. So, yeah, that was my reading of the Maya and the Rising Dark. And again, beautiful cover. I love the gold embossed title and the glossy, glossy cover. All right, everyone. So that is my review of Rena Barron's Maya and the Rising Dark. Let me know if you have read this book, what you thought of it, if you're going to continue on with the series, um, what you think of Rena Barron's work, if you'd like to. And uh, in the comments, if you've watched this video all the way to the end, I would love something powerful, any kind of um, emoji that reminds you of power and a little black girl. How about that? And a staff. Why not? Since we're at it. Uh, remember to read with purpose. Thank you very much for following along in this series. The next book that I'm going to talk about is also a book that I really enjoyed and that is Slay by Brittany Morris. I have a lot to say about this one. Um, there will be no costume change. I will see you in a minute and we will get to the next seven calorie shell review in my massive seven calorie shell review situation. All right, everyone read with purpose. See you in a minute.